Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. Uh, we're just waiting for a few more attendees to jump on the webinar and we'll get started. I hope you're all enjoying our false summer. <laughs> and I'd like to uh, thank our friends who have joined from the USA. And I think it's about five in the morning for you all. So I appreciate you joining. Happy to be here. Good stuff. Good stuff. Right. Um, people are rapidly joining by the second. I can see the ticker going up. We're up to 43 attendees. We might we might break the limit of this uh, this webinar, <laughs> which is uh, which is never a bad thing. Um, but what I'll do is we'll, we'll kick off with some introductions and I'll, I'll make a quick start if that's OK with everyone. Um, so hello and welcome today to uh, the first of a series of Connect webinars. Um, we very much appreciate all of you investing your time today. Um, today you're going to be participating in what's a very interesting and quite a nuanced topic. Um, the topic is the threat from within, securing your contact center from internal threats. Um, just before we kick off in earnest, I just want to cover a couple of housekeeping rules. So you're all muted. So you can't jump in vocally, but if you do have questions there at the top of your screen, there's a Q&A button. So please click that and enter your questions into the into the chat. Um, and then throughout throughout the webinar, we'll be um, we'll be inserting your questions where possible, where relevant. Forgive me if I can't get to all of you. Um, also, um, towards the end of the fireside chat that we're going to be running today, um, we will have the opportunity for you to respond to some several polls. So please do input your responses to those polls and we'll collate the findings towards the end of the session. Um, so I'd just like to give a huge thank you to our partners on the call today, Blockfish and Session Guardian, whom we shall introduce shortly. Um, as we know, in today's hyperconnected world, cyber and data threats are more and more common. That paired with the post-COVID increase of agents and employees working from home or businesses outsourcing contact centers overseas, ensuring your customer data is protected in these environments is commonly overlooked. Uh, today, we'll be discussing the type of threats that insiders pose to your customers, how to protect against said threats, and show you some methods that you may not have thought about previously to secure your customer data from breaches. Firstly, to introduce Blockfish, uh, who is our partner in all things cyber and physical security. Um, and then we'll move on to introducing Session Guardian. Before I do that, um, I just want to present to you the, the agenda for today. Um, just to make sure that if you have to leave for any reason, you don't, uh, because it's only going to get better as, the, as time goes on. So. Um, the, the agenda is threat from within. So we're going to have uh, an overview of some discussion points and some research from the Blockfish team. We'll then move into a fireside chat, which is your opportunity to ask some questions. So why are we still having cybersecurity challenges? Um, we'll then introduce the technology that Session Guardian bring to the table and the specific use cases. And the crescendo at the end is a, a fantastic demonstration of said tool. Um, so just to introduce the team, um, if Andy, you would like to introduce Blockfish um, and then hand over to the Session Guardian team, please. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Jack. Good morning, everybody. Thanks very much for uh, for having me as part of the discussion. It's great to be here. My name is Andy Green. I've been working in cybersecurity for close to 25 years now. And in that time, I've worked primarily in GRC type role, so governance, risk and compliance, um, all the way up to being a CISO for a number of organizations here in the UK and internationally. I'm also a co-founder of, of Blockfish, the organization that I'm representing here today as partners of Connect. Um, we are a managed service, a managed security service provider, an MSSP. Uh, we have five towers within the business. The first, as the name suggests, is um, around a managed service. And we started historically focusing on uh, ethical phishing, as a, as a, like I say, as the name lends itself to. We also have a, an AI and cyber practice, which looks at the intersection of those two uh, growth areas. We have an incident response practice. We have cyber um, advisory, and we also have a physical security practice. 
So we're coming up to our 10th year now. And over that period, we've helped organizations right across the spectrum from public sector, such as central government, defense, uh, and the critical national infrastructure through to financial services and non-for-profit organizations in solving their cybersecurity challenges. And as specialists in uh, phishing and the human side of um, security, inevitably we've worked with a large number of contact centers to solve the problems associated with social engineering. Thanks very much, Jack. I'll hand over to uh, Session Guardian. Hi, good. Hi, everyone. I'm Keith Barry. I'm the CIO for Session Guardian. Uh, we uh, have uh, products that do continuous identity assurance to ensure that only the correct person and the correct location on an approved device is looking at data from, from either in the office or, or remotely. Uh, we're a startup. We've been going for about four or five years now. Uh, and we have uh, over 40 clients. Um, I've had uh, over 30 years in financial services technology, managing global teams for large international investment banks. I was Scotia Bank's first US CIO based on some regulatory changes that were happening in New York. Um, and I was, did that for a few years and then moved on to uh, Columbia University where I ran a cyber research project on behalf of the Gates Foundation to protect mobile money in the developing world. Sudhir. Hi everyone, I'm Sudhir at PVPF Solutions here at Session Guardian. My team is primarily responsible for the overall customer journey um, at Session Guardian. So from the very first meeting we have with our customers and developing um, a solution strategy um, for solving and addressing the various insider risk scenarios we're going to be talking about today, all the way through the implementation and onboarding process. I've been in the industry for a little over 15 years um, and I've uh, delivered um, cybersecurity solutions across a lot of different domains from identity and access management, the data loss prevention, all the way through various insider risk and cyber risk mitigation and response um, solutions. Um, in all my time, I, I continue to see gaps that exist in the various cybersecurity technologies that existed. One of the things that are really excited of me about Session Guardian that I've joined about a year ago was the fact that we're finally closing the gaps that exist in a lot of those technologies and um, really helping our customers mitigate the risks that continue to exist today. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And over to you, Martin. Hi, yep. I'm Martin Cross. I'm from Connect, uh, the Chief Strategy and Technology Officer. Uh, my role is to understand what's happening in the marketplace, both in terms of technology vendors out there, but also what our customers are doing, um, understanding the challenges um, and the opportunities they have, and making sure that we have the technology partnerships, uh, service partnerships, to make sure that we can make them successful um, in their endeavors. Uh, that's my role. Thanks, Martin. And I'll be, I'm Jack Godfrey, I'll be your host today, um, but ultimately letting those much more intelligent than me lead the conversation. So, um, what I'll do now is, Andy, I'll hand over to you to give some insight into the market that we're seeing. Jack. So one of the recent engagements that I've been working with has been uh, to be seconded into NCSC. So for uh, until earlier this year, for 18 months, I was seconded into NCSC on a part time basis to as a senior industry uh, liaison. So for those of you who aren't aware, NCSC is the National Cyber Security Centre. So the, the technical authority within the UK for um, our cybersecurity posture, part of GCHQ. The sister organization to NCSC is the NPSA, as shown on that logo at the bottom left-hand corner there, the National Protective Security Authority. And where NCSC focuses in on the cybersecurity risks facing the country, the NPSA focuses on personnel and physical security. And so this year, the NPSA has released a initiative to get UK organizations insider risk ready as you can see there on the uh, on the bullet point that i've included so this is a um, a very notable and worthwhile scheme to focus in on an area of risk mitigation that is often overlooked within the organizations that we at blockfish work with so where many people are focused on the cyber threat coming in from external um, threat actors so coming in across our internet connectivity for example uh, or indeed, you know, as I was mentioning previously, from a phishing perspective where our employees are targeted and, and, a, and a cyber attacker uses the employee as the jumping off point to get access into your systems. 
the MPSA are far more uh, are focusing primarily on insider risk. And so to their mind, where you have um, any employees, then there's a, the potential for insider risk and insider threat. So this program that they've been um, promoting since uh, April of this year is focused around the fact that you can have, as you can see in this, these sort of promotional materials here, broken trust, broken reputation, broken confidence, if um, the threat from malicious insiders or accidental uh, insiders will lead to significant impacts and significant consequences. So we at Blockfish have been working closely with MPSA to uh, promote this within our clients and to uplift the capability within the organisations that we work with so that they are insider risk ready. And obviously this sits alongside the broader cybersecurity capability that, that, uh, that we work with a lot of our clients with. So as part of this, the MPSA undertook some research. Um, so their insider data collection study. And I thought that there were some very notable findings that it would be worth drawing out because this plays into why this discussion that we're having is timely and important. So some of the research that they found, and I'll run through each of these bullets um, sequentially then, the first point was that significantly more males engaged in insider activity at 82% than females. And I think that that's as a, as a result of the fact that um, males are far more risk hungry and open to taking risky behaviors. The second point there is that 49% of insider cases occurred within the 31 to 45 year age category. And in preparing for this webinar, we've been having some discussions about the insider threats, obviously, within contact centers. And <clears throat> Martin's got some interesting insights as to why that may be the case, specifically in that age group, when the majority of contact center employees quite often come from a younger age demographic. The point number three is around, <clears throat> excuse me, Point number three is around that majority of insider acts were carried out by permanent staff. So I found this to be quite a, an interesting topic. Now, this study, it should be pointed out, wasn't specifically researching contact center insider risk, but more broadly insider risk across all UK organizations. And obviously it was a sample of those 300 organizations were sampled as part of this, um, this data collection study. But in that, of those 300 UK based organizations, the majority of attack of uh, insider acts, and so that's malicious and accidental breaches by employees were carried out by permanent staff with only 7% of cases involving contractors and only 5% involving agency or temporary staff. And that was a that was an eye opener for me, certainly, because we often look at in the cyberspace supply chain risks and the, the fact that um, where you're outsourcing services, you can't outsource the risk. You outsource the capability, but you can't outsource the risk. And we often see that breaches are um, as a result of that outsourcing of capability. But here, with regards to insiders, permanent staff are by far the largest mm. of the um, of the the sources of cybersecurity and uh, data breaches. And then lastly, the majority of insider cases within the study were self-initiated at 76%. So it's worth just explaining what that means. What we're talking about within insider cases is, as I mentioned, so malicious or accidental cases of security breaches or fraud. And those were self-initiated in so much that the um, the agent or the employee that um, that was responsible for that act had undertaken that once they had joined the organization. So if you like, it was opportunistic. So they didn't join the organization um, as a result of deliberate infiltration, which was the 6%. So they weren't joining the organization with the intent of carrying out a malicious act or fraud, but rather once they were in and they saw the opportunity, perhaps they were presented with sensitive data, personal data, or credit card data. At that point, then their malicious activity was then uh, initiated. So again, I thought that was a very interesting component. We quite often are nervous about the fact that we may have in highly secure environments um, threat actors such as investigative journalists or people who are employed um, by a malicious actor into the business so that they can carry out their malicious activity. But 
on the whole, most of the uh, most of the insider acts, three quarters of them were in fact self initiated once the the uh, the employee was into the business under genuine uh, intent. So moving on to our insider risk mitigation framework. So this is a cut down version of the MPSA's approach to mitigating insider risk and to making your organization be insider risk ready. And so I've cut it down to the four main components as easy takeaways that the that you may be able to take back to your business um, and implement internally. So the first stage is to, to undertake risk assessment. Now, obviously, that's um, that's not unique to insider threat or insider risk, but rather all good security initiatives should start from a position of risk assessment. And the reason for that is obviously then what you're doing is you're identifying the scope, which are your most critical assets. So in this case, it may be the personal data that your contact center is is managing. You identify um, what the crown jewels within those assets are who the, uh, the threat actors that may be targeting you are, obviously, and then um, assessing them against the risk framework. And the MPSA provides an insider risk assessment, which is a 10-step risk assessment methodology that um, is easy to follow on their guide on their website, or alternatively, um, ourselves, Blockfish Connect, Session Guardian can assist you with. Um, but the, the purpose of that is then that will give you a prioritized focus for your risk mitigation. So that moves us on to point number two around mitigating solutions. And so typically what we see is that uh, in order to address insider risk and insider threat, that there's a significant uplift in the internal processes that are required, supplemented by technical solutions, such as the solution that we're going to see from our partners session guardian later in today's session. Once you put in the mitigating solutions, and it's worth stressing there that you can't reduce risk down to um, zero, security can never be absolute. And so what you're what you're seeking to do with the mitigating solutions is to reduce your risk down to a level that's proportionate to the risk you're facing and is within your organization's risk appetite. Once you've reduced the risk down to within appetite, then what you need to do is to monitor and detect that ongoing risk management. And so um, again, Session Guardian and some of the other tool sets that we recommend to our clients provide us with that monitoring and that detection capability so that you can maintain that uh, position of running at a risk which is tolerable to the business. And then lastly, um, we advocate that you test that risk posture and that you undertake continuous improvement. So undertaking regular reviews and looking to undertake testing, for example, running incident response scenario based exercises where you can test whether or not in the event of um, your contact center being breached, that you're able to respond in a well um, in a well practiced and a well oiled um, way, if you like, so that your processes are are um, as as well run as they can be effectively. So that brings Very us good. on to thank you, Andy. No problem. Thank you, Jack. No worries. So yeah, so that brings us on to our fireside chat, um, where we'll all be discussing the topic um, as to why we're still having cybersecurity challenges, especially when it comes to workers working from home, whether they be in a contact center, a service desk, whether they be data specialists, anyone really who's got access to sensitive or customer data, um, who is working from home or remotely, or even businesses who are leveraging outsourcers um, in the UK or uh, overseas are, are open to these threats. So I, the open question is, We've been remote working and leveraging outsources for a long, long time. Why are we still facing cybersecurity challenges and data challenges? Shall I, um, I'll pick that up first of all, um, if I may. I think that contact centers, so, so cybersecurity challenges and insider risk within contact centers are uh, very prevalent. Sadly, you know, it's a it's a it's a it's a truism within our industry that um, contact centers and call centers specifically suffer from significant cybersecurity and insider threats. I think historically that's come about from a number of reasons. And I think the first point is obviously the large amount of sensitive data that call and contact centers are managing. So 
everybody would be aware that the that large amounts of personal data, financial data, even passwords are mm. present within contact centers. And that makes them a very attractive target for criminals. So, you know, there's the old truism that um, that the criminals follow the money effectively, and there's money to be made in, in compromising the data within contact centers. So I think that's the um, the first point, Jack. The second is that because there's large um, there's large workforces and there's the human side of of security. So those vulnerabilities that we were talking about previously around phishing and social engineering, because obviously there can be large numbers of quite transient workforces, then I think they are particularly vulnerable to those types of scams. And then I think because of the fast moving nature of contact centers, so having a requirement for high levels of data accessibility, um, that contact centers need to be able to, and what I mean is, you know, they need to be able to provide their agents with access to data at a very um, a quick pace so that they can meet their customers' requirements for answers, you know, in a, in a, in a timely fashion. Then if processes are poorly defined, um, then that leads to the potential for cybersecurity and insider threat vulnerabilities. So I think that's historically why contact centers have often have, have suffered from from breaches and, and losses of data. But I think that more recently that's been exacerbated by various different challenges. And Martin and I were discussing this previously, so I'll hand over to him to give some of the detail. But I think it's that 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 larger distributed workforce as the um, as contact centers are, are um, becoming international. And so how we would describe that in a cybersecurity way is a much larger attack surface, so hybrid working, etc. I think in some of those instances, people are bringing their own devices, which then reduces the control that the the central IT team have over the, uh, the security posture of um, the, the IT that those agents are using. Um, and the fact that... Um, there are large numbers of outsourced third parties involved and consequently as we were saying you can outsource the service but you can't outsource the risk and so if 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 those uh if those third parties don't have as robust cybersecurity as you would mandate for your organization then you're you're exposing yourself to um to those risks martin we talked about we sorry we've just had a couple of questions to consider as well um in the next couple of stages so one from christina how does an auditor validate that customer data is secure in a remote working environment? And another great question, are you worried about the impact of AI in, on security? So some some thinking points for you, Martin, as we hand over to you. Okay. Uh, the, the AI one is well, that's very interesting because um, I think what, what we've seen or I've seen in the marketplace is uh, asking the question why we're still seeing these, uh, these risks. Um, we're changing the way we're delivering services in the contact center, how we deliver them. Uh, and AI is one of those drivers, but we don't often understand the impact that then has um, on the agents and how that works. So obviously we think of AI as driving um, chatbots, et cetera, to automate processes um, and not use those agents. But what it's doing is it's taking that uh, the everyday stuff away from agents. And the agents are now doing the complex stuff the high vulnerable customer stuff, the high valuable stuff. Um, and so they, they're they getting access to, to, to more data and more sensitive data um, to do that. And we're sort of super powering them as well, using AI to surface that data to them immediately. So what we're seeing is that the profile of agents is changing. And this goes back to something Andy was saying about the age group of agents, right? So if those agents are doing the more sensitive, more high value, more empathetic stuff, um, then perhaps there's a different profile of agent that is needed. And these agents are hard to come by. It's always been a challenge for contact centers to find um, the talent and retain the talent to work in a contact center. And I think that's been exacerbated by these trends. Um, and the way that businesses are addressing that I guess there's different ways of addressing it, but one of them is is home working and remote working. Um, obviously, there's been some changes in the uh, in the employment uh, regulations. There's also been obviously cultural changes post COVID about home working, and many companies believe that home working is a way of uh, retaining and incentivizing almost your existing customer, uh, your existing staff to stay with you, and that's definitely true. But what, I guess 
a lot of people are beginning to realize is, is that homeworking is a massive advantage to the business. Um, homeworking allows you to access a different demographic demographic of staff, which you can't necessarily access through the traditional um, contact centre location with people commuting every day. So you can you can access a different quality of staff, different demographic, demographic which is possibly better suited to those more complex uh, activities that they're doing. Um, but also you can be very, I guess, efficient in the way that you run your contact centre. Um, there's this trend to move to to what people are calling uh, micro shifts, where people uh, log in for a small amount of time at the peak, the peak points uh, in, in which you're getting demand. That isn't really possible when you're, you, you're working um, in, a, in an office somewhere and commuting to it. But in terms of home working, that is a real advantage that businesses can take, um, can take advantage of. So what we're seeing, I guess, is this, this a big driver to use home working remote working to better deliver those services to customers um, to attract staff that are harder to get hold of but you're giving those people much more access to data so you're presenting that security risk uh, that you need to manage and so that, that that's the combination either you you you're seeing the business saying no i want to do this because there's real business advantages the employees are saying i want to do it because there's real employee advantages um, but the business is saying I, I don't know how to manage that risk and obviously, this is why we're having this call today. Um, and Keith will obviously talk about this later. But um, identity management, uh, making sure that the people that you have hired are at the end of the screen using those credentials uh, is something that's not really been thought about when looking at co uh, contact center security before. We're thinking about securing the data and the network, but not actually securing the, the credentials uh, and the individual who's looking at, looking at that screen. So, so, that, so that's, I guess, that's the big push in terms of remote uh, working. But there's also other ways of, of attracting or, or getting those quality of staff. One, one is to go to professionals, let's say, and go to business process outsourcer who does this for a living, right? So you can outsource the agents to your business process outsourcer. But again, you're finding your the advantage of that is that you get well-run, well-educated, motivated staff. But again, you, you, you've lost control. You're, they're accessing your data. How do you ensure that those people who are in those environments are, are, um, are the ones that you want to be looking at your data? That you can walk behind someone's desk uh, and see data. Your, your environments where there are multiple clients being serviced in the same location. So how do you control that? And I guess the other way of, of finding those talented staff is to look further afield. And we're, we've seen a massive move to offshoring, particularly in South Africa, it seems, is a very popular destination at the moment where you've got incredibly talented people, um, you, you've got the right culture, the right time zone for English speaking um, contact centres. Um, and again, you, your, your risk associated with that is who, who is at the other end of that screen looking at your data. So you've got those three things. Often, actually, I see that the customers who are looking at all three of those at the same time. So they're looking at outsourcing, they're looking at offshoring, and they're looking at remote agents to get that best possible service delivery. And so that's where the business comes into conflict directly then with the security uh, and fraud team saying, well, how the hell am I going to manage that environment? I haven't got the tool set. We haven't even thought about the tool set for that. And so obviously this is where we've been out in the marketplace finding those right partnerships. Um, and this, I guess, is where um, Session Guardian and uh, come in and solve many of those challenges. Yep. If I can add there, if, when we talk about AI and impact on cybersecurity, AI certainly is um, on top of everyone's mind and how that can affect um, many organizations' um, uh, security posture. What we're seeing more and more um, being used, um, AI being used for, is really uh, around impersonation attempts. Um, you know, in terms of AI can really um, help bad actors impersonate um, individuals that are trying to um, log in with a set of credentials or even impersonate themselves um, through you know, various recognition methods. Um, and what we're focused on is using you know, our own AI capabilities to um, counteract um, attempts at impersonation um, using uh, the ability to detect deep fakes um, and other AI capabilities. Um, is a part of our strategy and as well, right? And that's uh, that's an important part, um, really understanding how AI can affect um, security postures and really counteracting that with our, our own set of AI tools.
So one Very of the questions that we see are, is, is around, you know, how do we audit um, and validate that customer data is, is, is being protected in, in a remote working environments? You know, Keith, maybe you can comment based on, you know, your experience, you know, having to provide that data, you know, to your regulators and auditors. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously auditing is a, a valuable function, especially in regulated industries. So if you call centers, um, servicing a healthcare provider or a financial services institution, you're going to have to make sure that your whatever your practices and procedures are in line with A, what the company expects and B, what the regulator expects. Um, because, you know, with, with some of the more recent legislation, especially over here in the US, uh, a, a, an organization is responsible for all its vendors and third parties. Um, so they want to make sure that, that you're rock solid on, on what you do. So the auditor is going to be looking at uh, making sure that whatever solutions are in place actually meet both the company and the, the regulatory needs. Um, but also from a remote working environment, the user privacy is really key as well. You know, within an office environment, you have some phys physical security measures. Uh, you know, you were in a, in a in a communal space. Maybe there was some CCTVs and public areas and stuff like that to make sure that uh, nothing nefarious was going on. But obviously, in a home environment, none of that's there. So making sure that whatever solution you put in place that potentially extends the physical security environment to the home office needs to not only make sure that the the data is protected from a from a a company perspective, but also user privacy is protected as well, and in line with whatever data or user privacy regs are in the area where the uh, where the, uh, the the person resides. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think um, one of the areas that we see with our clients here in the UK around contact centres is compliance with PCI DSS. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, there's there's sort of broader um, compliance. Um, requirements around GDPR for all personal data, um, uh, but most organisations, um, you know, they're, they're, they're assessing their GDPR obligations right across the organisation because personal data, you know, sits both internally for employee data within the HR teams, etc. So that's a better, perhaps a better understood, um, a broader understanding of the regulations there. Whereas PCI DSS often only applies to um, well, it only applies to the areas where credit cards are processed within the business, and obviously you try to limit your scope with that. But contact centers often uh, come into scope. Um, you know, we see clients that try to limit that by um, by managing con uh, pers credit card data in certain ways. But inevitably, that's an area that auditors will look at significantly. And so that raises um, a number of different challenges around how to meet um, PCI DSS obligations whilst handling sensitive information. And I know that from our discussions previously, um, that the, the work that you guys do within Session Guardian and some of our other technical solutions have an ability to be able to um, lend themselves to to minimising the auditor's challenge, if you will, of uh, yeah. of having to assess how well that's well, that's done. Perhaps you could right. give some insights into that, Keith. Yeah, sure. I mean, so one of the uh, this could this could maybe be. Uh, described as a cop out, but one one of the things that we do is, <laughs> as well as making sure that the user privacy is taken care of, an organised data, an organisation's data is its data. So what we protect is actually access to the session. We have no idea what data we're protecting. Mm -hmm. It could be it could be something you know, menial, or it could be the highest level of security that you you've got you've got. What what we do rely on is making sure that the person who has got the approved credentials, their organisation has given them the correct security posture to get access to whatever assets they have. What we will do is we will make sure that only that per that person, only that person, is viewing the data in front of the screen. So kind of protecting the last eighteen inches of the internet, um, mm. if you like, between the screen and the face. <laughs> And as, as Martin has coined when we first met him, um, the solution is brilliantly simple and Haji has copyrighted, Haji has copyrighted it. We've used that in every, every sales presentation we've done going forward. Does that Very answer good, those thanks. questions, Jack, do you think? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And look, I think um, it leads us on quite nicely to into learning how do Session Guardian actually support our customers and the wider industry in protecting data, um, not only from the workers, but 
other people and threats within the environment that those workers work in. Um, so I'm going to hand over to yourself, Keith and Sadir, who are going to show us some use cases and examples. Okay, um, so I'll run through the, the kind of little uh, couple of slides to tell you what we do, and then, then Sudir will provide a demo. So can you uh, start just moving forward on the animation, Jack? Um, so the challenges that we solve are we 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 solve eight primary challenges. So first, are credential hacking and credential sharing. Credential sharing is a much bigger problem than credential hacking, as you know anybody. And the organization is probably at some point given the username and password to someone to access something. Um, so what, what our solution will do is make sure that only the, the person with those correct credentials is looking at the data. And so, for example, Sudia couldn't use my credentials to get into something else that he shouldn't get into. Next one's Jack. And then we have compromised device and incorrect geolocation. I mean, there's other solutions that do this. Um, for a big enterprises we look at, we wouldn't expect them to use this to be using managed devices, but a lot of our users bring BYOD. So we want to make sure that they have a healthy device and that they're coming in from a correct geolocation, whether that be regional or a specific IP address that they have to come in from, um, according to the organization that they're working for, according to their procedures and policies. Next one, Jack. Then we get into the kind of more interesting stuff that we think differentiates us. So get user not present. So if you get up and walk away from your screen in a in a you know your home your home environment, or you, you maybe you've got flatmates that, that are kicking around that work for competitors, for example, if you get a, get up and walk away and don't lock your PC, our solution will automatically blank the screen uh, when it does not detect you in front of the screen. Next one, Jack. Then we have e-meeting sharing. I'm sure we've all accidentally shared something in an e-meeting that we didn't want to share. Um, uh, our solution will allow allow you to uh, will will block any sharing of a of a window that is protected by Session Guardian. So you can't accidentally share confidential data uh, or maliciously share confidential data, as all the end users will see is a black box. And then two really interesting ones are shoulder surfing. Um, so we want to make sure that it's only the person who's got access to the, to the data using valid credentials and only that data, only that person looks at the data. So anyone that comes into the, the, the field of vision um, of, of the data, maybe tries to look over someone's shoulder or even tries to nefariously sneak up and look in front of the person or take their seat, um, we will blank the screen because it's not the person that we're expecting to be looking at the data. And then the last one is, is one that's been a problem f forever. and, and uh, a couple of folks in our organization work for one of the big SIM manufacturers and, and they could not figure out how to do this, which is basically if someone tees up a, ca for a, a camera or a mobile phone to take a photo of the screen, we will detect that and blank the screen. So you, you won't be able to take a screenshot of the sensitive data. And we've had, we've had cases of uh, health BPOs that have had some sensitive health data taken off things. People like athletes over here in the US and the NFL and it ended up actually affecting some of the betting books in Vegas because there was a knee injury that was put out into the, the public and the, the team hadn't disclosed to the NFL that the player wasn't going to be playing that weekend. So big, big impact on, on things like that. So I use cases, you know, again, the correct person on the correct healthy device in an acceptable location, correct time of day, making sure only them and only them can look at your sensitive or regulated data. So what, what we do is... Our use cases are third-party access, contact centers. That, that's where we're seeing most traction just now, um, where um, people don't want to go back to, to the office and some of the BPOs and, and, and the contact centers, as we discussed earlier on, are looking to make sure that they get the get good caliber of staff that can work on an organization's uh, projects or, or look, you know, manipulate, sorry, uh, accessing organization's data, making sure that it's secure from somewhere that's not in an office environment. Remote and hybrid employees is just another another version of that where the employees themselves want to work in a, mainly in a hybrid fashion, um, where they have to go to the office a couple of days a week, but you want to have the same controls when they're not in the office working from home. 
And overemployment and interview fraud are, are a couple of interesting ones. So overemployment, and I don't know about you guys, but I can I can barely get on with one job, is where someone has actually got multiple jobs and is outsourcing those those um those jobs to people in, in remote locations, Africa, India, for example. Um, and they're tunneling through um, the company's VPNs or devices and, and using the person's credentials. Uh, it's a very, I'd never really heard of it until about a year ago. It's at least like a very lucrative thing. And there's Reddit channels that, that tell you how to do it and how to do it successfully. And then interview fraud, which is making sure that uh, the right person that you interview turns up for the job, uh, which we actually had one of our BPOs. We had someone who was um, a couple of folks who were not the people that they interviewed turn up. And then as we get up the kind of food chain to, to the top board, legal and MRA review and board member materials review, uh, we're seeing more and more of, of them. And we kind of, one of our solutions is available on mobile devices for board members to look at board books, et cetera. Because, um, you know, not to put different a point on it, as you get higher up the food chain, sometimes your cyber hygiene lacks a little bit. So regardless of the use case, what we what we do is that the person will be facially authenticated using the, the normal webcam. You don't need any fancy smancy IR camera. It's just whatever you've got on your device. If that person leaves the desk, we will blank the screen. If someone other than that person looks over, uh, tries to look at the data, we will blank the screen. As I mentioned, if someone takes a photograph of the data, then we will also blank the screen. So we're really making locking down access to the person and only the person who should who should have access to the data. So one of our biggest clients is a top 10 airline, and it's the contact center. Next slide, please, Jack. And their, um, their contact center, as, as, as kind of Andy and, and Martin mentioned earlier on, the contact center staff wanted to wanted to work from home, and they wanted to retain those those, those folks. And, and as Martin said, kind of widen, widen the talent pool to have a kind of um, more mature data, look at the more sensitive uh, client data. So the, the contact centers are in Europe and Asia, um, and we just kind of go through the animation, please, Jack. Um, what what we did was there was some fraud. There was some fraud that was going on within the contact centers themselves. So they didn't want them. They didn't want that. A they wanted to solve that, and B they didn't want to propagate to to work from home. So what the the actual use cases when they gave us the, the specs were literally like our, our kind of promotional materials, you know, no shoulder surfing, photos of the data, and they they needed secure access to both web-based applications and uh, native applications. And the key thing here was implement these controls without interrupting the agents on customer calls. So at no time did they want any of the customer calls who were taken to be disconnected. So we deployed um, session guarding desktop. Now this this was on a roadmap, and we brought it forward for this um, for for this particular client. We managed to get an alpha version up and running within a couple of weeks, which they proved out, and then we've been we've been developing and implementing the solution um, after they kind of signed on a dotted line for us. And one of the things that we always claimed was we you know we were we were user privacy first, and we knew we were, but we couldn't really prove it because we didn't have a client who in, in Europe who could go through all the hoops with the trade unions and GDPR and privacy council, et cetera, to actually um, validate our, 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 uh, our, our, our claims. And now we've done that, so we feel pretty good about ourselves. And our solution is user privacy driven for us. We grew up in big law in the US, very litigious society. So literally, you know, the, the user privacy was one of the first things that we made sure the solution did. And as, as we got through there to make sure that we were, were compliant with the regulations and we get through the kind of all the cyber and HR legal teams, it was a it was a real point of a kind of we did actually high five ourselves because it was a real validation point for the organization. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. It's really interesting. And um, it's interesting to see the the use cases that you share, because there are some use cases there that result in data breaches that us on an everyday basis will never think about and they're usually the ones we're probably most at risk from so i'm really excited to see the demonstration that sadir is about to present and um, before we do that um, and i'd like to call on ingrid here um, we're going to release some polls um, so please do participate in the polls i think we've got three or four questions we'd like to ask the wider group and audience um, so ingrid if you could please post the polls to start with so the first is is your contact center managed in-house 
or do you outsource it to a third party provider? Interesting. So it seems that the majority of our of you on the call today manage your contact center in house or service desk or or similar. Um, very few are outsourced to a third party. Um, some are not sure. I'm assuming that's Connect employees. Uh, all those who are just on the call. Okay, very interesting. So we, and the next poll, please. Do your employees or contractors wish to work from home? This is an interesting topic. This is a topic that seems to be cropping up in the news on a daily basis. I think Ernst Young are now um, moving to um, enforcing up to five days a week. Um, I think Amazon themselves or AWS have just announced that they're going to try and push for five days a week for non-home working uh, employees. Um, um, we've got a, a response that is a unanimous of 100% um, believe that employees and contractors wish to work from home. The next one, do you have home workers handling personal data? Uh, an interesting one. And it's uh, on a daily basis, we get asked that question from our customers. You know, what data can we see when we're managing and securing and uh, implementing rolling out contact center offerings? What data do we have access to? How do we protect that? Can we ring fence that into the EEA? They are very, very common questions and concerns from businesses. So let's see what the response we get. 64% um, of businesses on this call are handling personal data. Um, and 20% are handling sensitive data. Very interesting. Looks like there's many on here who might need Session Guardian to support them. Sorry, couldn't resist. Um, in your opinion, what area of remote workers security needs the most improvement to mitigate internal threats? Is it employee training on data security? Is it enhanced monitoring and analytics tools? Is it stronger control measures? Is it improved incident response and recovery plans? Um, there's a fine balance you need to strike here when it comes to company culture um, and not acting like Big Brother, perhaps. Again, there's lots in the news um, at the moment, but at the same time, protecting the integrity of the data of your customers and your brand and your business um, is also important. So let's take a look at the results. 45% um, of people are saying stronger access control measures. Um, and we're pretty level in terms of improved incident response, enhanced monitoring and analytics tools and employee training on data security. I think given that we all have to, as businesses, go through ISO accreditations, et cetera, and I think the training programs across businesses and from an onboarding standpoint are pretty well defined. But as um, Andy said earlier in the analysis that we've done in the marketplace, those who are potentially threats to a business do not join as threats and become threats. Um, so continually monitoring your employees um, against br data breaches is going to be really, really important in the future and is, is right now. Very good. Very good. So that some of the data there was interesting, um, but not unexpected. I think um, unanimously we need to uh, we need to be monitoring more um, more distinctly those who are working outside of the office. Uh, home working is absolutely relevant and prevalent in our in, in our industry and the wider industries and the the employee workforce today. Um, regardless what the big businesses out in the marketplace are trying to achieve, they will still have home workers. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how we can help provide those monitoring tool sets and what the solu a solution might look like. So, Sadir, I think we're going to hand over to you now for a demonstration, in which case you'll take control of the screen. Um, over to you. Sounds good. Thank you. Let me share my screen. So as part of the demonstration, what I'll be showing is the Session Guardians um, solution starting up and um, uh, 
really going through the initial posture checks. Uh, as was discussed before, Session Guardian is really focused on ensuring only the authorized users in front of the device, um, using those set of credentials, accessing the data, viewing the data that's on the screen. When workers, employees, contractors, third parties are in the office, you have those physical security measures to be able to ensure it's the right individual that's coming into the office, logging in with those set of credentials to access the organization's data and resources. When employees, contractors, their parties are remote, it's harder to rely um, and, and extend those physical security controls because you never really know if a set of credentials are being used by the individual that they were authorized um, for. Um, we see this very commonly in third parties where when you onboard a certain number of individuals um, as a part of a service engagement or a project, uh, what we often see is uh, the same set, the set of users that were onboarded may not stay on um, throughout the duration of the project, but those credentials are not revoked. They are not reissued, and any new individuals that need to gain access to those resources um, are not vetted again as a part of that onboarding process. So we're really mitigating um, a lot of those risks and challenges that exist, um, uh, especially with third parties, but then also um, with employees, uh, as we've heard from Keith, we're seeing a lot more of um, um, common occurrence now where employees will interview for a job, um, but they will actually outsource their job um, to another individual or another group where it's not vetted by the organization. They'll share their credentials or even worse, share their access through their devices to those individuals so that they can do that work on their behalf. Session Guardian is ensuring um, that only the authorized users in front of the device. So what Session Guardian does um, first, when Session Guardian first starts up, it ensures that um, uh, the user profile is downloaded. The user profile will define what is the security posture that we want to be applied to the to the device. The security, security posture could um, look for certain things like ensuring the right security software is still installed on the device, hasn't been tampered with, um, hasn't been disabled. Um, we could also look for certain things like ensuring the right access controls are enabled. We can also verify that the um, individual is coming in from the right geolocation. They're coming in from an approved network. So, for example, if I am a remote worker, I'm only authorized to work from my home office. Uh, we want to ensure that I'm only logging in from my home office rather than logging in from a public location where potentially sensitive data could be on a screen for unauthorized users to view the data that's on the screen itself. So the user profile will determine what is the security posture that's required on the device. It will also contain the profile photo. And what Session Guardian is doing is using that profile photo um, in a privacy conscious manner to be able to then do that recognition to ensure that when I am logging into the organization's environment or protected applications, that data is um, protected. Uh, and I'm, I'm the authorized user that's looking at the data. So we can see Session Guardian. This is Session Guardian VDI here. We have Session Guardian VDI, Session Guardian Web, Session Guardian Desktop, and Session Guardian Mobile. And the reason we have all of those different offerings is that uh, depending on the type of application or the environment or the resources that are being protected, the device form factor uh, really determines what is the, the solution that's appropriate. Here in this case, what we're going to demonstrate is the Session Guardian desktop capabilities, where Session Guardian will start up when the user logs in into Windows and is continuously ac um, active. And so we're ensuring that um, I am the, the person that's in front of the screen and accessing the data. It's also going to verify that it has access to the webcam because the webcam is important um, to ensure that um, it's using the facial recognition, to make sure I'm the authorized user and I'm in front of the device continuously. I'll click start secure session here, but typically a session guardian will start up um, with the user logging into Windows. And with session guardian, you'll see that there's a banner that goes up, you and user is notified um, that they're logging into a uh, protected system or application. Um, and then what you'll see across the screen, they're very light in this case, but the, the watermarks across the screen here will also identify the user that's logged in into the device. The watermarks are very important because we want to ensure that um, 
that there's um, identification of the user that's logged into the device, the IP address that they're connecting in from, um, displayed across the data that's visible on the screen. So long as I'm in front of my device, um, I'm the only authorized user that's in front of the device that I'm um, allowed to access the data, view the data that's on the screen. If I have just a data, couple of questions there, Sudhir. Sure. Sorry to jump in. So no that are relevant to that. Um, how do you ensure it's the correct person when first registering their facial credential? Sure. So during the registration process, the end user is um, either required um, to submit a selfie photo of themselves during the registration or onboarding process. Otherwise, we can also use an, um, a photo that may already exist within um, the HR directory or physical security badging system. That photo is very important because that is the photo that will then compare um, the, the face or the, um, that we see through the webcam um, during the recognition process. For remote employees that are completely remote, that may not have um, already gone through some onboarding process where they've had to submit a photo, then there is a registration process where they'll be instructed to um, take a photo of themselves, submit that during the registration process, and that photo is what's used to do right. um, all of the recognition. Great, and it's a second question linked to that. What if a manager needs to work with an agent? Can they look over the shoulder of the agent? Yes, so Session Guardian, while we're ensuring that only authorized users looking at the screen, we also have an ability to allow shoulder surfing um, for authorized individuals. So in a contact center environment, that's a very important um, capability where there'll be a shift supervisor that will be walking floor and will have to periodically look over the shoulder of um, their team members to provide assistance. There's also scenarios where um, an individual might need to provide training to another team member. So both individuals are sitting in front of the screen. Um, the, the team member being trained will have to look over the shoulder uh, uh, and use the access that's been provided to the authorized user. So Session Guardian does have an authorized shoulder surfing capability um, and will we'll protect the data um, and only ensure that those individuals that have been authorized to do so can view the data that's on the screen. Great, thank you. One of the things I'll do as part of the demo is, you know, show what would happen. Let's say, um, as I am right now in a hotel room, and um, or if I'm in a, um, a Starbucks and I have data that's on the screen, um, I obviously won't be able to show the show the shoulder surfing scenario because there's no one else that can walk behind me um, to trigger the shoulder surfing protection. But if I have data open on the screen, if I forget to lock the screen, log out of the computer, um, disconnect um, from the network. Um, I'll, I'll simulate that by just simply placing my hand over the camera. We've configured Session Guardian um, after a period of five seconds to block the screen automatically. So if I leave the device unattended, Session Guardian is no longer able to continuously recognize that I'm in front of the device. It will block the screen. We've set the period, a timeout period here for five seconds, but typically it's more like 45 seconds. And then if I don't come back in front of the computer within 10 minutes, it'll completely disconnect me from the session, um, further securing the data that's on the screen. As soon as I remove my hand from the camera, Session Guardian again re-authenticates me and then uh, gives me access back into the into the device or the application that I've got open. <clears throat> I don't have to go through again any other cumbersome login process. It just as soon as Session Guardian sees them in front of the device, um, I'm able to, um, to gain access um, to the data that's open on the screen. Now for remote work, types of scenarios, it's very difficult to prevent, once the data that's on the screen, individuals from taking photos of the data that's on the screen. And what Session Guardian does is it'll recognize that there is a mobile device or camera uh, that is pointed at the screen and will block that. So I'll show, and we've slowed down this recognition so that you can see this uh, in effect during Teams call. But as soon as I try to take a, a phone or mobile device or camera, and I try, pointed at the screen to try and take a photo of the screen. As soon as I do that, Session Guardian will display the block screen, prevent me from taking a photo of the data that's on the screen itself. Now we can configure Session Guardian to completely terminate my access um, and prevent any further attempts to take the photo. For the demo purposes, we've simply enabled just a block screen so you can see that working and, um, uh, and the detection uh, as it happens. In addition to detecting the use of mobile devices, we can also prevent screen share. We've disabled the screen share prevention for the purposes of the demo, otherwise you would just see a blank screen. 
um, over the team's um, webinar here, but we can also prevent inadvertent sharing of potential sensitive data through Teams, Zoom, WebEx, any variety of e-meeting types of screen share solutions. Fantastic. Um, and you're bang on time, Sadir, and that's that's amazing and really interesting. I think it's um, it. This, when I said at the beginning, we'll witness some nuanced use cases and some nuanced resolutions to problems. I really, uh, such as data protection, I really think we've uh, we've demonstrated those. It's commonly um, it's commonly a risk and something that many businesses haven't considered. What you know, what are you doing about your customers to raising a phone to to their screen to take photos and maybe maybe sharing those on a WhatsApp group or whatever it might be. It's imperative that you protect against the, uh, those threats. So look, I would like to thank everyone for your attendance today and thank you for the participation from everyone today. It's been hugely interesting. This session is recorded um, and also we'll be sharing notes and follow ups following today um, and we look forward to the next webinar. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, and everyone. Enjoy the full summer. <laughs> Bye now.